of the church year are celebrated in a more solemn way for eight days in a row. Call them the octave of Christmas, the octave of Easter in particular. And so this celebration today, as we go towards the eighth day of the Christmas celebration tomorrow, each day is meant to give us an opportunity to savor a little more deeply, to see a little more clearly what the gift of Christ at Christmas is meant to be. What's the big deal that he came into this world? And more than just why Christ came, what it actually has to do ultimately with you and me. In these days, we've had celebrations of St. Stephen the First Martyr, St. John the Evangelist, the Holy Innocents, and some moments to kind of focus our attention that the reason Jesus came was not so that we could have warm and fuzzy feelings because we gather around a baby, but rather to remind us that in the midst of all of that wonder and glory, that there is a challenge that this one brought to us and any of us who belong to him have to be ready to live up to that challenge, have to be open to what might happen to us as a result of following Christ. And so it's in many ways about us also and not just about Jesus. Back in the second century, St. Irenaeus of Lyon wrote these words, God has become what we are, what I am, so that I and we might become what God is. Now our brothers and sisters in the Orthodox churches talk about this process called theosis, which is a growing into God-likeness. It doesn't mean that at some point in time we become equal to God, but that we become more and more deeply imbued with God's life, and that we become more truly partakers of the divine nature of the one who took on our human nature to give back to us what had been lost to us in the sin of Adam and Eve. That's why on Christmas Day, one of the selections of the gospel that can be read is this gospel that we heard today. And why we're given this gospel is to remind us that Jesus came, not many people really knew who he was, what it was all about. And even after they began to listen to him and encounter him, they still wouldn't receive him. But those who did, those who were open to him, he gave the power to become children of God, gave power to become those who are in that process of growing more and more into Christ-likeness, which is what you and I are supposed to be about in this life of ours. And so, a couple of centuries later, St. Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, in the Christmas sermon that we have a copy of, says these words, For the Son of God in the fullness of time, which the inscrutable depth of the divine counsel has determined, has taken on him the nature of humanity, thereby to reconcile it to its author, in order that the inventor of death, the devil, might be conquered through that nature which he had conquered. Christian, acknowledge your dignity and become a sharer in the divine nature. Refuse to return to the old baseness of degenerate conduct. 
Remember the head of the body of which you are a member. Recollect that you were rescued from the power of darkness and brought out into God's light and kingdom. By the sacrament of baptism, you were made the temple of the Holy Spirit. So from the moment we were baptized, we actually have been partakers of the divine nature. We've been given an identity that comes from God himself through Christ our Lord. We've been made living members of Christ's body. But also we've taken on the identity as children of God. And as children of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And just like parents pass on the life to their children, pass on that DNA to them that gives them their unique identity in the world. So we who have been born again by water and the Spirit, whether that happened to us when we were babies or when we were teenagers or as adults, all of us who have been born again by water and the Spirit are those who are now partakers of this divine nature. Partakers of what Christ came to bring us in the first place. To restore to us what had been lost to us. So that we could become fully alive in God. That's why Christmas is such a big deal. That's why we celebrate the coming. Not just to fixate on the baby. And all the wonderful feelings that are generated by a child. All of that has its place. And it's a reminder of this beginning of a new way of living in God that's been given to us. But the child grew up. And that's why I'd like to share this part with you. Uh, Nathan Mitchell, who is a former Benedictine monk, wrote in this publication, Liturgy, in 1980, of some of the implications of Jesus' coming. Quote, Christmas calls a community back to its origins by remembering Jesus' own beginnings as a human child, a prophet of God's reign, a judgment on the world and its projects. What the parish celebrates during this season is not primarily a birthday, but the beginning of a decisive new phase in the tempestuous history of God's hunger for human companions. The social concerns of the season are thus rooted in Jesus' proclamation of God's reign, the renunciation of patterns that oppress others, holding, climbing, commanding, and the formation of a new human community that voluntarily embraces those renunciations. It is an adult Christ that the community encounters during the Advent and Christmas cycles of Sundays and feasts. A risen Lord who invites sinful people to become the church. Christmas does not ask us to pretend we were back in Bethlehem, kneeling before a crib. It asks us to recognize that the wood of the crib became the wood of the cross. And so, as we prepare to, to end a year and begin a new one, we are invited once again to reflect on who we are in Christ who came to share our humanity so that we could come to share in his divinity and to better appreciate today and in all the days to come what that identity means for us living in this world. You know, in the letter to the Galatians today, Paul says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth uh, his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, so that mankind could do no boasting before God. He came as one of us, so that we could become as he is, and as the Father wills. And that's where we glory. That's why we glory. That's why we can 
rejoice like we hear in the first reading today and why we can humbly accept that God has singled us out in this world. We who are Christians have what we call that, um, that scandal of particularity that all of us who profess faith in Christ, all of us who have been baptized, all of us who have become partakers of the divine nature are different from those who have not. Not that we are better, but the way we look at life, the way we conduct ourselves in the world, the way we go about doing things and saying things, and just the kind of people that we are meant to be ought to be different from those who don't profess it. Again, not in an arrogant way or with an air of superiority or trying to dominate or oppress or anything like that. But just that who we are, who we have been made, ought to color everything we say and do. Help us to become more just, more forgiving, more merciful, more compassionate, more truly Christ-like, because after all, he came to give us that gift, to make us partakers of the divine nature, to give us in every way all that God can so that we can become all that God wants us and knows that we can be. The Eucharist that we celebrate today is again that moment of encounter where Christ comes to you and to me, to us as a community, in his word, in one another, and in the sacrament that we are about to receive. And he does so, so that we can know that we are his, and that he also is ours.